stories of the ultimate betrayal. One using the pulpit, the other using a bottle of pills. First, the cocktail waitress and the doctor's son, and the baby they hadn't planned on having. What were your feelings at that moment? Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy good and oh boy bad. I was never gonna do anything to harm that child. But he was. And wait till you find out what. I can't believe that he betrayed me this much. Bitter pill. Plus, what happened when a married woman fell in love with her pastor? Her husband ended up murdered. Tonight, a checklist for the almost perfect crime. Look for the life insurance? Check. It wasn't even 24 hours after Mandy had been killed. Hit the tanning salon? Check. She wanted to look good for the funeral. Maintain her glow. Airtight alibi down to the exact minute? Check. And the threat bar about... 2.41. But who pulled the trigger? I mean, really, who does this? This is soap opera stuff. Tonight on Betrayal. Here now, David Muir and Elizabeth Vargas. Good evening. Most people go to church for forgiveness, but what the New Hope Church members got was truly unforgivable. A betrayal in their midst with nearly all Ten Commandments broken. Including thou shalt not kill. And what would ultimately catch the killer was a mysterious love letter left in a trash can, torn into pieces, but not nearly enough. Tonight, right here, you'll see for yourself those interrogation tapes that helped break this case. Here's Jim Avila. Independence, Missouri. Stick a pin in the middle of an American map, and this is what you get. Bible country, home of Harry Truman, where a love of God, country, and guns meet. And on this day, Independence is saying goodbye to a man who personified all that middle America is about. Family man and former Marine, 42-year-old Randy Stone, pillar of the community, and now murder victim. He was a fun-loving person. He was one of these people that... Uh, no matter what he was doing, he, he was making the best of it. And it was constant jokes. And Randy was just a fun, infectious person to be around. Hundreds turn up for the funeral, listening to Randy's pastor, best friend, and spiritual advisor, David Love, give a stirring, heartfelt eulogy. We sit here today and we weep, not just because of the separation from our loved one, but because of all the questions that death brings. Questions like, why? Why him? Why now? Pastor Love delivered a powerful eulogy. It was a very warm and comforting thought that he was in heaven, that he was in glory. Without answers, death seemed so cold. But mourners were not the only ones in attendance. Detectives were there too, recording in the church that day because they believed the killer might be attending the funeral. It was, after all, only days earlier that Randy's wife, Teresa, stumbled upon a horrific scene, a murder mystery. It was the middle of the day. She stopped by the insurance company she ran with her husband. As she pulled up, she noticed things just did not look right. The shades were drawn during business hours and the doors locked. She came into the office and then found him laying in her office on the floor, he was laying on his side and was bleeding. She stepped over the body and placed the phone headset on to call her parents, told them that Randy had been shot, and they said, then call 911. 911, do you need police fire medical? Yes, I do, please. Okay, take, take, take a breath. Where are you at? The police got to the scene. She ran out the door, collapsed in the yard. Teresa not only had lost her husband of 19 years, the father of her two children, Michael and Miranda, but the man she had known since childhood, says Randy's mom, Clara. So how did he meet Teresa? We was on the same block. They kind of grew up on the same block, so he'd known her for years. At 18, Randy enlisted in the Marine Corps and lost touch. But when he returned to Independence, their relationship reignited. Gets out of the Marines, it becomes more serious. One day he came in and said, we're getting married. He had a nice wedding out at New Hope. 
Just like that. Soon they had a son and a few years later a daughter. A picture-perfect family in a picture-perfect American town. He's a you know, former Marine, tough guy, but his devotion to his wife was really something to behold. He wrote poetry to her. His marriage was, was, was the center of his life. And the glue that kept them together? Their church, New Hope Baptist, where they were married and had their children baptized. Drove church buses, advised them on financial matters, taught Sunday school classes. Teresa was helping in the kitchen to singing in the choir. She was always there. Randy was there every Sunday, Wednesday night, and if there was an activity, he was there. He really fed on the spiritual nourishment that that church offered. With family, faith, and a tight-knit circle of friends, it seemed Randy and Teresa were leading a righteous, pure, even devout life. He told me he would love her till the day he died. And believe me, he did. But now the 42-year-old insurance salesman with no known enemies lay dead in a pool of blood, a single bullet wound to the head. Police began to comb the crime scene, and more than $150 still sat on the desk. His wallet never moved from his pocket. So what did this tell you about whether or not this could be a, a burglary or gone bad or a robbery or, or just this random stranger? This looked exactly what it turned out to be, like an execution. Probably somebody that he knew and trusted and shot him in the, when his back was turned. The murder took only one shot. Investigators find the single 40 caliber bullet casing on the floor and another intriguing piece of evidence that would turn the case within the first hour in a nearby wastebasket. One of our people went through a trash canister next to Teresa Stone's office desk and there was a, a one-page letter that had been torn up in multiple pieces. What it amounted to is some type of a, like a happy birthday or a love letter. Happy birthday, love. I'm not in control of things yet, but when we're fully together, your birthday will always be exciting. Anyone's attempt to shred it was pretty pathetic. It was ripped into nine squares and placed in the trash can on the day that Randy happens to be murdered in the same room. I adore you. I'm blessed by you. I need you. For savvy veteran police detective Keith Rosewaren, this was not adding up. Did you determine at the scene that this was not Randy's love letter to his wife? There were some handwriting samples on Randy's desk. The handwriting, the penmanship really didn't look the same. Suddenly, a love note gives police their first clue in the mystery of who done it. The first possible reason into why this God-fearing, beloved pillar of the community would be struck down. The church closed ranks around Teresa, consoling and comforting. Even her husband's eulogist, Pastor David Love, rushed to her side. David called and told me, and he said, are you sitting down? Randy's been shot and killed. I drove straight to the office, and then I was fighting the police. I wanted to go in and see my baby, and they wouldn't let me. Police take Teresa down to headquarters for questioning, but even before she gets there, her behavior begins to raise eyebrows. They put Teresa in the patrol car, and they drive her off, and almost instantly, she tells them she's all out of tears. and. She doesn't know if they're going to think that's strange, but she's all cried out and just instantly has recovered. When we come back, the interrogation tapes. How does Teresa Stone go from a grieving widow to a prime suspect? We have a page and a half of things that's not jiving. The game of cat and mouse begins. I have told you everything that happened on that day. Well, Stay with us. Plus, a pregnant woman in love with a doctor in training and in love with a baby he doesn't want. This is your child as well. The devious trick he plays on her that they don't teach at med school. 2020's Betrayal continues. Once again, Jim Avila. Even in the perfect crime, it's the details that can often foil the plot. Like the single shell left behind in Randy Stone's insurance office. Or a torn up love note in the trash, just a few feet from his body. 
details police are anxious to hear from the woman who discovered Randy's body and seemed to recover from the grief of losing her husband of 19 years in about 19 minutes. Raise the shade on the interrogation room and listen to Teresa Stone. I saw blood coming out of his ear. Okay, blood coming out of his ear. And his eye was really puffy. And I noticed he wasn't breathing. Listen as Teresa offers up random suspects. Her first statement to the police was that she had seen kind of a dirty looking black guy walking around the back of their building and he probably killed him. I think he had a mustache. He was pretty tall. Or perhaps it was that client, the one who had made a pass at her one day. He's a Kansas City cop. Nice. Okay. As for her own whereabouts on the day of the murder, well, Teresa had a well-documented, perfectly recalled account, an uh, alibi for her day, starting with a doctor's appointment. Well, I was supposed to be there at 1.45 to fill out paperwork, and my appointment is actually at 2. Okay. But the bank was kind of slow, so I didn't actually get there until about 10 till. That's fine. And I left there about 2.15. So I went shopping at Dress Bar. <laughs> I left Dress Bar at about 2.41. Wait a minute. 2.41? You sure it wasn't a quarter to three or maybe 2.30? 2.41. Nope. 2.41. No one who wasn't preparing for that would be able to recite their whereabouts down to the minute um, the way Teresa Stone did. Okay, her alibi may be airtight, but what about those other details? Remember the love note? Well, apparently Teresa doesn't. Okay. Listen as police blindside her with this nefarious little clue. In your trash can, they had a letter that somebody had written about having a birthday and all that. It's about this big. It was all tore up. <sighs> She seemed a little taken back by the question, a little surprised. She seemed to collect her thoughts. So your detectives do what at that point? The detectives leave the room, and they say, we're going to go get the note, we'll bring it back to you, maybe that will refresh your memory. No, just a second, we'll be right back. Okay. But once the detectives were gone and they were out of the room, she, she kind of sat there and she looked at the floor, and then she whispered under her breath. Did you catch that? Listen again. She also forgot police were recording her with a hidden camera. When police re-enter the room, Teresa tries desperately to recover. Yeah, I, I remember. Um, and I've had it for a very long time because I kind of had a secret admirer. It was left um, on my car door. Yeah. And it was in there. He's a secret admirer. I, I, I don't know who he is. Then your BS detector goes off? Yeah, that's, that's not right. That is not right. And this doesn't smell right either. Come on. Only a day after her husband's murder, and before he's even buried, she meets with Randy's close friend and insurance agent, Robert Davis, to, you guessed it, grill him about how many zeros might be on the life insurance check. She seemed distraught, and, and then it was like a switch flipped, and, and she asked if we could go downstairs to their home office and laid out on the desk were all of these life insurance policies that Randy had taken out over the years. There wasn't even a death certificate yet, right? No, that's correct. And she was wondering when she was going to get a check. Right. How did that strike you? Odd, given the fact that it wasn't even 24 hours after Randy had been killed. Okay, now this might seem like piling on, but you won't believe what else this grieving widow made time to do just after the murder. She's at the tanning salon, making sure that... Wait, she's, she goes to get a tan. <laughs> she went to the tanning salon, and in addition to maintaining her tan, she talks to the owner about what she could do to have Randy's tanning credits transferred to her account cold. Oh, I, that fact really just stuck with me. So she wanted to look good for the funeral. And maintain her glow. And it's not just us. Others notice Teresa's strange way of mourning her husband's sudden violent death. She shares the news with an out-of-town pastor who says she goes from murder to matter of fact in seconds. And during the conversation she, um, after we talked about that just for a few moments, she switched and began to ask about my wife and my daughter. Unnerved, he calls Pastor Love to tell him what happened. He began to tell me what he had done. 
during the course of the day, his wife had called him and told him to go to the hospital and visit a member. And he'd stopped, he even told me that he stopped to buy a fish sandwich somewhere. It occurred to me that you're giving me an alibi. Two airtight alibis, one from Teresa and the other from Randy's closest friend, Pastor Love. But what would a pastor have to hide? Could his very name be a clue? When we come back, the worst kept secret at the New Hope Baptist Church. What happened to the baby? I miscarried. Stay with us. A small church in the heart of the Bible Belt. Its pastor, a suave, smooth-talking reverend, David Love best friend of the now murdered insurance salesman, Randy Stone. Police are curious why both Love and Stone's widow, Teresa, seem to go out of their way to establish an alibi. So I left dress bar about 2.41. Police are starting to suspect that Pastor Love may have been living up to that suggestive name. There are rumors of an affair between the pastor and Teresa, and they're making the case that the affair was the motive for murder. We have a page and a half of things that's not jiving. This was a planned killing. No. <laughs> it was a planned, premeditated killing. And more than one person was involved. I have told you everything that happened on that day. Well, I'm telling you that... I have they seeds have to show you. My daughter was with me. I already... Teresa, I already know what you're going to say, but I have to hear it from you. <laughs> yes, we had sex. Okay, you know that. I know that. I know that. And I, you know what? I'm not going to judge you for that. Initially, she denied ever having been unfaithful to her husband. Then she admitted to <laughs> sexual affairs, then to a 10-year-long affair where they're having sex daily with the pastor of her church. But their clandestine affair becomes harder to hide when Teresa ends up pregnant. And the big problem with that, she's married to a man who had a vasectomy. Randy had had a vasectomy previously, so it came as a real shock. And were you suspicious? Randy and, and Teresa just presented that it's only maybe 99.9% .9 effective, and that was the, the one little sliver of a chance, and, and it happened, so it, it was what God wanted. Divine intervention? Not even this man of faith was fully buying that. Randy matches Mother Teresa's betrayal with one of his own. He secretly takes her off his life insurance policy and makes his children sole beneficiaries to the tune of $600,000. She was not the beneficiary. I had to call her and inform her of that. What was that conversation like? Total shock that, that he could have changed that without her knowing that that was the case. Randy's suspicions were spot on. That baby was the love child of his good friend and spiritual counselor, Pastor Love. Was there ever a time when you became pregnant with David's child? Yeah. That was a long time ago, wasn't it? Yeah, it was about six years ago, actually. What happened to the baby? I miscarried. Okay. Turns out someone else was suspicious of Teresa and her pastor, the pastor's wife, Kim, who tells police her husband was spending a little too much time puttering around the garage. He went out to the garage because he said he wanted to get his, his shoes. His feet were cold, he said. And I thought, that's really weird. So I walked out there, and I said, what are you doing out here? And he said, I'm just putting my shoes on. And I said, you're hiding something from me. Kim Love, doing a little bit of her own investigating, also discovers a hidden cell phone in the garage. Well, I knew it was from Teresa because I saw the text from her. But was the affair alone enough to turn Pastor Love into a killer? Police soon learn that there is also a rift between David Love and Randy Stone over church finances. About two weeks before the murder, Randy Stone announced to Pastor Love that he was leaving the church. Money was disappearing, and he was asking questions, and Randy didn't think that was right. 
Randy Stone was a threat to David Love for two reasons. He was about ready to take away Teresa. And Randy Stone also knew enough that he could have crashed David Love's career. So police had a motive. All they needed now was the evidence. Police start to turn the screws on Teresa. Sometimes the smallest of details become the biggest of bombshells. And Detective Rose Warren zeroes in on a small discrepancy in Teresa's story. Remember, after finding the body, she told her parents that Randy had been shot. But she omitted that little nugget when she called 911. Who told you that he'd been shot? How did you know he'd been shot? And why didn't you tell us? You're not being truthful with me, truthful. I didn't You're know. Not being truthful. Uh, I. He sent me a text and told me. Who did? Say it. There it is. Teresa finally gives him up. Her cohort, her lover, the man who pulled the trigger, brother love. I think she just said, you know what, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to continue to protect him. I'm going to throw him under the bus, and I'm going to save myself. Oh, no, no. But oh, Teresa yeah. is going to betray her beau again. I'm scared, guys. Only okay. minutes later, no Teresa, still playing the role of a grief-stricken okay. widow, tries to get Brother Love to confess to murder on a tape phone call. Pastor? Yes? This is Teresa. Hi. Uh, I just want to say... We need to talk. Yes, now. I want to know why. I want to know why. Teresa, why, why? You know what? I need to know why you killed my husband. I need to know. But alas, there would be no come to Jesus moment from Pastor David Love. He doesn't take the bait. So police decide to bring him in for in-person questioning, hoping they can break him in the interrogation room. Sorry, you have to be here this time tonight. I definitely need a, some kind of representation because I'm a preacher. I'm not a, I don't know the law. But while Pastor Love wasn't talking, Teresa was spilling it all. Did he say how it happened? He said he, he said he walked in the office and he just aimed and didn't even look. So he said he pulled the trigger. That's what he told me. Reverend Love, what do you have to say about Randy Stone's death? Eight months after the murder of Randy Stone, police finally take Pastor David Love into custody. A shocked community comes to grips with a sacred trust broken. David Love betrayed his church. He betrayed his faith. He betrayed everything he felt dear to pursue this woman. Pastor Love, did you did betray you your trust this? as a pastor? Did you commit this crime? Pastor Love takes a plea deal of second-degree murder. He's now serving life in prison and could be eligible for parole in 2036. Teresa, indicted for conspiracy to commit murder, took a plea deal to have charges reduced. And as part of that deal, you had to acknowledge her role in the crime. Corrections for a sense of eight years. She admitted that she gave David the alarm code to her house and the combination to Randy's gun safe so that he would be able to go into her home when nobody was there and get uh, one of David's guns. Teresa was sentenced to only eight years in prison. In my mind, I feel like she is every bit as guilty as the pastor. The only difference is he pulled the trigger and she didn't. And as for David Love, the pastor who eulogized the man he murdered? But we anticipated he would grow old. We anticipated that we'd do more things together. David broke all the Ten Commandments. Every one of them. Obviously he lied. He committed murder. He committed adultery. He committed, you know, false witness. I mean, you go on and on. David committed, he, David broke all Ten Commandments. And so that is the ultimate act of betrayal. Have you ever been betrayed by someone you trusted? Tell us your stories on Twitter throughout tonight's program. Use the hashtag ABC2020. Elizabeth and I will be right back. Next, a prominent doctor's son, a pregnant girl who worked in a bikini bar. How can you not be excited? This is your child as well. And a literal prescription for disaster. 
when betrayal continues. She thought she had met Mr. Wright, the son of a doctor, training to be a doctor himself. And when she got pregnant after a whirlwind relationship, she thought she'd finally found a future as a family. But he saw things very differently. Now, the controversial case that's been making headlines and could set a precedent in court. What sinister trick would he play on her to make everything go away, including her unborn baby? She thought she'd met the one. I prayed to God and then he walked in. To hear her tell it, they had a connection that would change the person she was and wanted to be. I'd given up a lot of hope, but he was, uh, he picked me right up off the floor. 27-year-old Remy Jo Lee had been a student at the University of Southern Florida until bad luck and a few poor choices took over. She straddled both sides of the tracks, a student by day, a sizzling dancer by night. Then John Andrew Weldon, a handsome student studying medicine, the son of a rich doctor, literally walked into her life. We met at the Class Act, which is a gentleman's club where I was working. It's a bikini bar. So your uniform was to wear basically a bikini and serve drinks? And, and chat with the men. Sounds like the um, old sort of Japanese custom of the geisha I guess clubs. a redneck geisha. Right, a redneck geisha. Okay. <laughs> Remy's from Lutz, Florida, a quiet town on the outskirts of Tampa. It served as the inviting pastel suburban neighborhood in the romantic fantasy film Edward Scissorhands. I love you. And up until a few months ago, that was Lutz's claim to fame. And then came another romantic fantasy that even Hollywood couldn't have imagined. Remy says the two had an instant connection. We hit it off, just out of the park. It was great. He was finishing up his last year at USF Medical School. I was very impressed with his perseverance and his drive. So impressed that she began thinking about upping her game. It was time to hang up the bikini. Well, I feel as if he caught me literally with my pants down. This was somewhere I never imagined I would be. I wanted to be someone he could be proud to be with. Her time working for tips at Class Act had come to an end. Well, I quit that job after a week, and then I got my wonderful job at Chipotle about a month later. My job with pants, as I like to call it. Your job with pants. Job with pants. So out of that most unlikely of places, that dimly lit bikini bar, a relationship seemed to blossom. Remy says she was spending more and more time with 28-year-old Andrew, the man she nicknamed Muffin. So how serious a relationship did you consider this to be? It, it was just this emotional connection. Did you understand this to be exclusive? During parts of it, yes. And during those other parts, no. He had went through a long-term relationship with a young woman named Tara, and he said that that relationship had ended. Did he say, I love you? He did. Did he ever say to you, I want to marry you? No, but it didn't seem like I was going anywhere quickly. Andrew may not have been ready to take her to the altar, but it didn't take long before he was taking her to bed. Surprisingly, there were never any discussions about birth control. Did you have any understanding with each other around birth control? We never used any. He never even used condoms with me. I went through my eighth grade sex ed class. I was well aware of what could happen. If that sounds a little reckless, listen to what happened early one morning this past January. After a night of drinking, Andrew and Remy get into a car, and sure enough, they're pulled over on suspicion of DUI. What's your name? Explain your back. And in custody in the back of a police car, she was recorded begging the man of her dreams for his devotion. Do you love me? Lord. Are you going to stand by me? Would you be with me now? Remy was the one behind the wheel, and though she would not be charged, you can hear the desperation and disappointment in her voice from the back of the squad car as she tells the officer her worst fear that her behavior may have cost her the man she loves. That is the love of my life. That is the inspiration. I, I let him down. I'll never marry him now. Maybe not, but apparently the sparks of intimacy were still there. Within days, she would become pregnant with Andrew's baby. I took a test and it came up positive. I took up two more and they both popped up positive and oh boy. Oh boy good and oh boy bad? Well, 
it's going to be an adjustment for everybody involved. That's an understatement. Andrew was still inching toward a degree in biomedical sciences and religion. Marriage to Remy did not appear to be on the table. People who would like to see the worst in people will say she's desperate. She feels this prize out of her reach now slipping away and she does something to get him back. This was never a plot, this was never a plan, this was never a scheme. It wasn't the right time, but whenever I found out about it, everything changed. Everything changed. Remy, ecstatic, had already picked out a name. So tell me about the name Memphis. How did you come up with that? Memphis was his favorite place. We always spoke about it. I wanted to name him after his father and his mother, so Memphis Remington. But she still had to break the news to Andrew. And I was trying to get it in contact with him. And he wouldn't pick up the phone. He wouldn't, you know, respond. And I had to text it. And I texted him a photo of the pregnancy test. What was his response when you texted him that message? He was not pleased. What did he say? What are you going to do? And I told him, you know, keep the baby. The string of text messages that followed shocked and saddened her, begging her to abort the baby. But Remy had made up her mind. No, no, I was never going to do anything to harm that child. Then, curiously, Andrew suddenly became a doting dad. He brings Remy, now nearly seven weeks pregnant, for a prenatal exam at the office of the most respected reproductive doctor in town, Stephen Weldon. Andrew's father. Well, I didn't have medical insurance at the time, and I also thought that a loving grandfather would perform the best service for me. And, and did you see the heartbeat? They simulated it, and it was so exciting. There's nothing like seeing your own child grow inside of you. And how did Andrew seem during the visit? He was very upset. He looked like he was about to cry, and it deeply hurt me because, you know, how can you not be excited? This is your child as well. The very next day, her prenatal test results came in. Surprisingly, they weren't coming from the doctor himself. They were coming from Andrew, the doctor's son. He said I had a mild infection and that I just needed to clear it up in order to not hurt the baby. So he said he was going to bring you a prescription for what? For amoxicillin. So when he brought you the prescription, did everything look normal about the bottle and the pills inside? As far as I knew, he brought that. He brought other prenatals. Prenatal vitamins. Yes. Maybe Andrew really was coming around to the idea of being a father. And I thought, when Memphis comes along, he'll be holding him and showing him off and a proud dad. At work, she could barely contain her excitement and showed off the sonogram of baby Memphis taken by Andrew's father. I was so excited, and all my coworkers were so excited for me. They knew how much this meant to me. A few hours later, everything would change. While on her way to work, she took one of the pills Andrew had given her. Her shift was from 4 to 11, but she wouldn't be able to make it past 7 o'clock. Stay with us. Continues with Betrayal. Once again, Elizabeth Vargas. This is a Nana favorite, I'm sure. Aww. Remy Jo Lee says her lifelong goal was to be a mom. It's a little baby. <laughs> I wanted this baby more than anything. Not because it was Andrew's, but it was my baby as well. It was part of me. She was seven weeks pregnant, bearing the child of the man of her dreams. I was fine. And then I ate that pill and everything wasn't fine anymore. Describe what you were feeling. I went from being pregnant and sick with, you know, morning sickness to a horrible pain. Like someone had shoved a bayonet into my stomach. What did you think was happening? Just, I had eaten something bad. And then when did you know this was something worse? The next day when I see all this blood. What did you do then? I, I had to go to the hospital. I had to save my life, and I was hoping for any that There was some chance that Memphis would be okay. What did the doctor say to you? This pregnancy is over. <laughs> the chaplain came in and gave a final prayer. Andrew had told her the pill he gave her was amoxicillin, but Remy quickly learned it was something else. And you knew it was the pill, something. Did you look at them? Did you pull them back out? Whenever I looked at them, I noticed they were scratched off. And my, <laughs> this is when the nightmare began. 
I thought, oh, it's just one. I can't even imagine how someone could do that. The next time she speaks to Andrew is from her hospital bed. Only this time, the authorities are listening in on the call. The trap is set, and Andrew takes the bait. I was hoping that in no way was he involved. When did you finally realize that, in fact, he was? He told me. What did he say? He told me what the medication was, and it was Cytotec. Cytotec. The drug Andrew had admitted to giving Remy is ordinarily prescribed to prevent stomach ulcers, but is also known to cause miscarriages. And the deadly warnings are clearly stated on its packaging. Warnings Andrew hid from Remy. He apologized and he said he was the most horrible person. I don't even know how to explain how hurtful that is to hear that from in his voice, telling me this horror story about what he's done to me and to our baby. Andrew not only betrayed Remy, he betrayed his own family. After his father performed that prenatal exam on Remy, Andrew would steal a page from the doctor's prescription pad. Remy's attorney, Gil Sanchez. John Andrew then apparently walks in with this uh, forged prescription, hands it over to the individual in the pharmacy. So he forged a prescription scratched off the markings of the Cytotec pills to make them look generic, delivered these pills to Remy, and instructed her to take one. He did all of those things. Andrew's father, Dr. Weldon, said he was blindsided and devastated by his son's actions. He and his wife, Lenora, spoke up for the first time, telling us this was not the Andrew they knew. It's tragic, and it's totally had a character for what kind of person he is. Describe him for people who haven't met Andrew. What kind of young man is he? He has been singularly the most uh, kind, uh, thoughtful, compassionate of all of my children. Loving, caring about other people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why he wanted to go into medicine. It's just uh, devastating now. The Weldons say they were surprised by something else. They had met Remy only once and thought Andrew was destined to marry someone else. He had dated a young woman, Tara, Tara, yeah. for a long time. Yes, he was planning to marry her. Did he have hopes and dreams of having a family of his own? Yes. Do you think he'll get that chance again? We hope. That chance may take years. Their son, a once promising medical student, was charged with murder. But under a deal, he pled guilty to tampering with a consumer product and mail fraud, charges that will likely land him in prison for nearly 15 years. While Andrew awaits sentencing, he's confined to a very strict house arrest. This is more than just a routine house arrest. He had to put bars up on the windows, deadbolt locks on his bedroom. He has an ankle monitor on. We have two uh, armed guards present 24 hours a day. In support of their son, the Weldons have burned through their life savings. Half a million dollars is a lot of money. It's 401. It's all of it. But you know, he's <laughs> worth every bit. bit of it. We're talking about the length of the sentence. You know, I'm 66 years old. 15 years, I may not be here. Andrew's attorney is Todd Foster. It was a stupid, tragic, unbelievably regrettable decision on his part. He's admitted what he did, and he's going to be punished. But Remy's lawyer says the punishment doesn't fit the crime. Andrew Weldon could have faced life under the Unborn Victims of Violence Act, but that's a law not in place in Florida, and Remy wants to change that. I will not back down. I'm here for myself and for all of the other victims to spread awareness and to help prevent this from happening to other women. You see this one? Oh, look at that one. Oh, oh, no. Remy says that it's the support of her family that has helped her through this. Oh, we want to say we love you, Remy, very, very much, and we stand 100% behind you. And we're there for you. I just wish we had the baby here, too, to have fun with. Here they've been in a very wonderful, loving family. And as Remy thinks about Andrew, she's still hurt by the man she loved. It's amazing how this turned so terrible, and it didn't have to be. I'm just a girl from Lutz that fell in love with the wrong man. 
Tonight, that wrong man, Andrew Weldon, still remains under house arrest. He'll find out his sentence this coming December. We'll be right back. And that's our program for tonight. But if you're in the mood for more tales of betrayal, then you'll definitely want to tune in this Sunday night right here on ABC. It is the premiere of the new series Betrayal about love and broken trust and a lot of it. That's 10 p.m. Eastern right after the season premiere of Revenge. I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And I'm David Muir. I'll see you here for the news this weekend and from all of us at ABC News in 2020. Good night. Every day, more Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. The Once Upon a Time two-hour season premiere event, Sunday on ABC.